Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 56th episode of VisionCon Live, your go-to nerdy talk show. I'm your host, Zach Wilson, being come here to see me today, UK. Let's meet the man of the hour. He's pardoned from Record of Lotus War, Dr. Yun slash Mirage Master from Pokemon, Alfred Vanderpool from All My Children, just to name a few. He's the acclaim acting and voice acting extraordinaire himself. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the one, the only, Bill Timoney. Bill, how are we doing today? I'm doing very well, Zach, and how are you doing? And I'm delighted to be number 56. Ah, dandy is candy, and that makes two of us, Bill. Now, I want to continue our conversation during the pre-show, because I thought it would be something that a lot of the people that watch it later on YouTube or listen to on Spotify would like to hear as well. Yeah. So you are, you were bitten by a longhorn tick, correct? Right. But okay. I didn't know it for about a decade. The longhorn tick comes from Texas, but now is in my part of the world. I live on the Jersey Shore. And my wife and I have two dogs, and so we're always in the woods. So ticks are no ticks are a common occurrence in our lives. But apparently, I got bitten by this thing, and I didn't know about it because they've only got the research done in the last year or two. But the just the way the um, the deer tick uh, transmits Lyme disease to a human, well, the longhorn tick transmits transmits something called alpha gal syndrome. And what alpha gal syndrome is, it makes you unable to digest mammal meat cattle pork hamburger steak bacon whatever you can't digest that the problem is if you get stung by a bee and you're allergic you know in seconds you you're allergic to peanut butter and you eat some peanut butter you'll know in seconds but digesting meat kind of goes this alpha gal thing goes undiagnosed because it's hours later let's say let's say i have a big steak which i haven't had in years sure. And it takes my body hours to digest it. And when it finally gets to that, we can't do it, the body breaks down. And it's, I, I hate getting rushed to the ER. I really do. But now that I know this, I was diagnosed a couple of years ago. So I haven't had any kind of mammal meat. There's some, there's some um, literature that says it might be possible for my body to digest uh, primate meat. So a primatozoid, a prosimian, but I, I'm not going to be eating monkey at all. Sure, I can understand I, that. I love fish anyway, and I'm fine with, with, with bird. I can get my protein from chicken or turkey or, you know, so, so I'm okay with that. But the problem is the definition of what mammal meat is. For example, I think it says to you in the pre-show, table sugar is brown, but to make white table sugar, because sugar does not naturally appear as white, there's a blanching process they go through where they stain the sugar white by using ground up bones of cattle and pigs. Uh. So when you use table sugar, you're, you're actually eating meat. You're eating mammal meat. Wow. You, wa you want to know what's the worst part though? Yes. Glaze. Glaze. Glaze uses a process that includes parts of cattle and pigs. And when I say glaze, candy corn, Halloween candy corn, that shiny exterior yeah. of it, cupcakes, cake frosting. That's meat. That's, that's beef. So I can't eat any of those things. Man. Isn't that nuts? For all our vegetarians. Nuts I can eat, but no. You know, no. Nuts you can eat, but yeah, all of this is nuts. And I'm, for our vegetarian viewers, I mean, this has been a very eye-opening opening. Oh, I'm sure, the, I'm sure the vegans out there going, told ya, told ya. We told you. We all told you. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm glad you get, can at least enjoy some meats, but you know, still. Uh, I can, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm sure I could get um, my, my uh, complete protein from reptilian if I wanted to, to eat alligator. I don't want to eat alligator. Uh, I, did, I tried alligator. Did I you? A yeah. couple years ago, I was at a fair. And I'm not usually huge on fair food, but there was a mm -hmm. vendor that sold alligator meat. And I was like, yeah, why not? And you know, it's not bad. It tastes like a slightly chewier uh, pork. Okay. So, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't eat it on a regular basis by any means, but, you know, I wouldn't kick it out of bed for eating crackers. Gotcha. I'm very big on fish uh, and shellfish. So sea, seafood is absolutely fine with me as my primary uh, complete protein source. But, no, I haven't tasted a burger or a steak or, or anything like that in years, and I, I don't think I ever will again. Do you ever miss it? No. No? Okay, well, no. that's it. At least I'll give you happen. another one. Go for there's it. A, there's a filtration process when they make white wine that uses that same sort of animal byproduct. 
So you've got to be very careful of say you're, you're vegetarian, if you're vegan um, and you drink white wine, there's only a few uh, vintners who are now putting out wine that does not use this process. Otherwise the vast majority of white wine, it's basically meat. There's, there's meat in there. That'd be rough because white wine is my wine of choice. Mm. Well, but you're not, a, you, but, but you're, you're okay eating mammal. Knock on wood. Okay. Unless, unless tonight, uh, Longhorn Beetle, or not Longhorn Beetle, Longhorn Tick. Uh, Longhorn Tick. Me. Yeah, I keep wanting to say Beetle too. It just, it just sounds right. Well, Longhorn yeah. Beetle. Yeah. <laughs> Well, guys, ladies and gentlemen, this is episode 56 of VisionCon Live. Before we kick things off, I did want to say something and want to do one of my favorite things to do in the world. That's an ad read. Because, ladies and gentlemen, this week's episode of VisionCon Live is brought to you by Anime Collectors United. ACU is your one-stop shop for all things anime. Whether it's memorabilia, autographs, or just your daily anime memes, the ACU is your place to be. Visit them online at Facebook. ACU or Anime Collectors United. And thank you, ACU, for sponsoring today's episode. Woo! I love doing ad reads. Well done. Well done. <laughs> thank you. And then, Charlie, if you're watching this either now or later, man, you're the best. We love you. And thank you so much for setting this up. Yes, Charlie. Thanks for hooking us up. Now, Bill, to start us off, we have a lot of characters, both in acting and voice acting, that you have played over the years. Right. And I want to dissect at least three of them through this interview. But what I want to start it off with is how we got here. Was showbiz always the plan? Or did something happen later on in life that kind of brought you to where we are today? I was going to be, uh, I'm born in 1958. Right. So as a boy, I was going to be the next Jacques Cousteau, Marlon Perkins, and play right field for the New York Yankees. Uh, I, I didn't want center field. I figured I wasn't that good. I, I could play right field for the Yankees. Uh, but then I started seeing movies as a little boy, especially the monster movies. So my first hero was uh, Boris Karloff. Uh -huh. Then my second hero was Peter Cushing. And uh, Cushing is interesting for me because he, he's a very intellectual actor, but he always finds a place to bring some really... Um, virile physicality to everything he does. Like at the end of Horror Dracula, when Dracula has him trapped at the end of the long uh, banquet table and Cushing jumps on the table, runs to the window, dives onto the drapes, pulls the drapes down and the sunbeam comes through and catches Dracula. That was Cushing's suggestion on the set. Really? That instead of just going to, to the drapes and revealing that the sun had come up, he said, let's have him trap me over there and I'll be resourceful and I'll run down and I'll jump and... So I've always liked that about Cushing. And then just as I hit uh, puberty, I saw my first Sean Connery, James Bond film. Oh. So the plan was to, you know, to live life, the James Bond sort of adventure. But I discovered something at the age of 11, when my mom dropped me and the guys off at the double bill of You Only Live Twice and Thunderball, <laughs> that changed my life. And that is at the climax of You Only Live Twice, when they're doing the countdown for the rocket and Bond is fighting Blofeld's henchmen and all that stuff, it keeps cutting back to a Blofeld technician going, three minutes and counting, two minutes and counting. It's a very specific voice. But there I am in the movie theater at the age of 11 and I shouted, that's not him, because who I'm looking at, a few weeks earlier I'd watched on the NBC Saturday Night at the Movies, I'd watched the shot, a shot in the dark, the second Pink Panther film. Uh, and it's the film that introduces Inspector Clouseau's sidekick, Cato. Now, I didn't know his name was Bert Quoke. Hmm. I knew him as Cato. And now who's doing the countdown in the movie but Cato? But I know what Cato's voice is because I just saw that movie and that, that's not his voice. So I figured out even back then that there was something called revoicing. And the Connery Bonds are packed with revoicing. You're looking at one actor, but a completely different actor is doing the voice. It's not dubbing because dubbing is putting a different language on. It's the same language. It's just a different, it's almost like uh, when you have a star in a movie like Audrey Hepburn and My Fair Lady, but that's not her singing. It's Marnie Nixon singing, who also sang for Natalie Wood in West Side Story. And the Connery Bonds are packed. It's almost, it's almost like Ken Adams' set design and John Barry's music. The same three or four voice actors do all the supporting parts in, in those movies. Uh, you watch Goldfinger? Yeah. Who plays Goldfinger? 
Uh, oh, I don't know his actual name. <laughs> his actual name is Gert Fro. Okay. But when you're looking at Gert Fro play Goldfinger, you're not hearing Gert Fro. Am I not? Nope, you're hearing a completely different actor. And the Connery Bonds, the producers, Broccoli and Saltzman, always kept that a secret. Really? Ursula Andress and Dr. No, not her voice. Do you know why they do that? Yeah, because Cubby Broccoli wanted his actresses to sound as sexy as they looked. Oh. And the first one, Dr. No, Ursula Andress, has a very pronounced Swiss, Swiss German accent and rather a mannish voice. Okay. So when they got into post, he hired a young woman who was an actress named Nikki van der Zeel, and she did her voice. And they had extra time on the session. So Eunice Gason, who plays Sylvia Trench in the first scene, right? Mr. Bond, James Bond. That whole thing, right? <laughs> Playing golf in his, in his shirt and all that. That's, that's uh, Sylvia Trench, Eunice Gason. She had to come in to re-record some dialogue. So Cubby Broccoli said, you know, Nikki, can you change your voice a bit? And she did. So she does Ursula Andres's voice. She does Eunice Gason's voice. Oh my God, I would if have you, no idea. Yeah, and then Eunice Gason comes back in from Rush With Love, but again, Nikki did her voice. So they sort of stumbled on this thing. And then Nikki was hired to help Gert Frobe on the set of Goldfinger get over his German accent. And it didn't work enough. So when you hear, you're smart with the talk, old finger. No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. That's the voice of a, a British actor named Michael Collins. That's not Gert Frobe's voice. Oh, my God. So even as a kid, when I started getting into this thing, doing high school musicals, shooting little Super 8 movies in the backyard, then going to college and starting to work on soap operas and do commercials, I always wanted to find a way into revoicing. And it took me years and years and years, but thanks to the first anime I did, I was then able to get into what they call looping and dubbing and revoicing, both live action and animation. And well, it's, all because, it's all because of, of Kato in You Only Live Twice. Hell yeah, shout out to Kato. Yeah. Well, and we touched on a couple characters that I do want to dive in deeper with. And the okay. first one you set up perfectly, that of course is one of, if not your first foyer into the anime world, and that, of course, is the one and only Parn. Now, before oh, look we... at him. Oh, look right. at him. Yeah. A whole unit. Wow. Now, before we dive deeper into Parn, can you give us just a brief overview of the character, maybe how you got the part, any fun accolades involved during the part, anything at all? Sure. Um, Parn, as you know, is, is impetuous. He always acts before he thinks, and that's a really fun role to play. Uh, but he also feels deeply. Uh, he's young. He's immature, so he doesn't understand his feelings for Deedlet. But like all adolescent males, he wants a quest. He wants an adventure. So he has great spirit, and I really love that. And I wore my hair like that when I was his, when I was his age, <laughs> when I had hair. So I really identified with Parn. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the importer of, of uh, Lotus War, Central Park Media, wouldn't let me audition. Really? Yep. Um, I had broken through with um, a project that they were dubbing that was very notorious. And it was my first opportunity to work on Mike. Yeah, God, I had my hair exactly like that. <laughs> um, and a friend of mine and I sort of became the unofficial casting directors for Central Park Media dubs. And we did uh, a couple of little things. We did something called Battle Skipper. We did something called My, My, My. Uh, we did a couple other little things like that. And they were really fun. And I would plug in doing small parts. I loved something we did called uh, Iria, Zerum the Animation. Mm. Loved doing that one. And I knew a lot of good theater actors who I thought would do well uh, doing this. And I'd bring them in and I would train them. Because my friend who was sort of the, the head of it, she did a lot of live action movies. And she was getting me a lot of work looping, uh, dubbing and movies. So I handled this stuff. And then it came time for their big thing, Record of Lotus War. And they said to my friend, they, they told her, uh, uh, we've heard Bill enough. Let's bring in some different voices. We don't want to hear Bill for this. Well, I looked up Parn and Lotus War, and I really wanted that part. So my friend, Sandra, said, change your name. We won't tell him. 
you know, because for each character's audition, they say, we want to hear five options and they're numbered one, two, three, four, five. So they would say for Ato, hire number three, for Deedlet, hire number two. So they didn't have the names. My, you know, Sandra had the, the names. So only after they chose them, they would say, what are their names? Now, Parn is younger than me at the time. I was in my thirties. Uh, so I wanted to use a, a younger name. And my name is William Regan Timoney. I'm named after my uncle, Bill Timoney. So I thought, no, his, his name was Bill Regan. So my name is William Regan Timoney. So I said, well, let's go with Billy Regan. Because Billy sounds younger yeah. than Bill. So Sandra's told the guys at Central Park Media that she'd found this new actor named Billy Regan. And they said, we love him. Great, he's Parn. <laughs> but as a result, Lotus War was so popular that as more work started to come in, I found myself a little caught because they were looking to, to hire Billy Regan. So I just stayed Billy Regan. And that's why when you look at my anime history, a lot of the credit is Billy Regan because I created this whole other persona, this young guy who does a lot of anime dubs. <laughs> I was going to ask you that because on your IMDb page next to some of the characters, it says voiced or uh, credited as Billy Regan. Right. Right. <laughs> I've been, I've been living a double life. Yeah. Bill, double Bill Timoney life. is an on-camera actor and Billy Regan dubs anime. <laughs> I love it. Well, uh, besides Parn's uh, hair, which you shared at the time, was there anything like, cause you voiced and played Parn for a yeah. very long time in multiple projects. So yeah. I have to imagine, was there ever a point where you started to relate to Parn on kind of a personal level? Oh, immediately. I mean, for what I said before, the, the idea about adventure and, and the uh, impetuousness of him, you know, he needs Ato to be a little more spiritual and to be more, more thoughtful. Uh, he needs Deedlet to be more grounded. But again, you know, since he's a young guy, he's all confused about how he should be feeling toward Dilit, which is nice when you get around to Chronicles of the Heroic Knight. Mm -hmm. Their relationship has changed, they're together, and Farn has a haircut. <laughs> um, but I found out they were doing Heroic Knight, and I had moved to LA because my career had come to a just crashing stop in New York. Tried LA, and it wasn't getting any better in LA. And I found out they were doing this and I called the guy who was doing it. He said, well, you look, you know, you're in LA. And the reason why I think a lot of anime fans don't know this, the reason why when you watch series, voice actors change is because anime dubbing, especially when it started in the U S in the 1990s pays nothing. It's, it's amazing how little it pays and actors need to work and they need to go where there's work. And if you, let's say you're, you're a musical theater person and you get a nine month tour of, you know, of, of Footloose that's going to drive all over the country, you're not going to say no because I have to stay in town because I'm, my character might come back on, on Heroic Night in a couple of months. So that's why voices change so much because the anime dubbing um, importers uh, pay the voice actor so little. That is insane. But, but, but I couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle the idea that Parn would be voiced by somebody else. So I would fly back with my own money on this incredibly cheap airline. Uh, and I, I can remember, and, and the producer, a wonderful guy named Mike Alban, uh, he was directing, he was adapting the, the script. He would record me last of one block of episodes and first for the next block. And I'd fly in, I'd sleep on friends' couches for a couple nights. Uh, I got paid this next to nothing. And there were times I would take the subway out to JFK to fly back to LA. I remember one time I had four bucks in my pocket. Wow. And there was like nothing back waiting for me in the bank in, in LA. Yeah. I was, those, my, my 30s were really tough times, but there was no way I was going to let somebody else uh, record Parn. Well, I mean, if, I mean, for what it's worth, I could never imagine anybody but you voicing Parn. Well, that's nice of you to say so, but there's somebody listening and watching right now named John Turner. Okay. And John is just about the most insightful uh, anime fan uh, you can find. And he writes 
terrific reviews. Uh, okay. He's out there on the chat rooms and all that. He's a great, great guy. And he's an enormous, I mean, really dedicated to animation, especially anime. And uh, John, uh, John and I have met. Uh, my wife and I have seen him perform in a, in a show at his college. Wow. Um, and he's a great, great guy. Uh, and he'll be the first one to tell you that my performance as Parn in Record of Lotus War is excellent. And my performance as Parn in Chronicles of the Heroic Knight. Mm, really? Well, look. Well, in, he, in, he, he's actually, and on that note, he's in the chat right now. He asked uh, two questions, which on that note, guys, uh, for those of you who have already messaged VisionCon directly or put in, your li in the live chat your viewers' comments and questions, great. You guys have plenty of time to do so. We're going to get to those at the end. But yeah, no, he's definitely in the chat. <laughs> Good man, John. Good man. Yeah, it's, well... And here's the thing, it all has to be fast. You could be very good at dubbing with conceptualizing the character, getting the right sound, and you can be very good at syncing. You have to match, you know, the mouth flap. Yeah. But, and I've done a lot of directing myself of the, of the dubbing recording sessions, and I adapt a lot of scripts. I don't just act in anime. I've done a lot of things in anime dubbing. Hmm. The actors we would hire were actors who could record 40 to 45 cues an hour. Okay. Now, in an action project like Lotus War, some of the cues might be, ah, uh, ha, you know, that kind of stuff. And then some of the cues are, blah, 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 you know, a five sentence paragraph. And you've got to nail that. And if you can nail those kinds of things in one take, two at the most, then you can work in anime. But it doesn't matter how good your voice is and how well you sync. If you're not putting down that high number of cues per hour, then, then we lose money. And sometimes quality is sacrificed. And there's, a, there's a more than a few cues in Chronicles of Heroic Night I would love to have back. <laughs> but, but every now and then you, you hear from the booth, the, that's good enough, moving on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So, well, I mean, so, so John's, John's point about uh, Heroic Night is, is right on. Well, I mean, my, uh, my applause to you for at least admitting that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, for decades, Babe Ruth led the history of Major League Baseball in home runs. He also had the all-time record for strikeouts. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> nope. You know, you get put in the Hall of Fame in baseball if, if, you, if you make out seven out of 10 times, which means you get a hit three out of 10 times. And that to them, that's, that's Hall of Fame caliber. Nobody bats a thousand in anime dubbing, Zach. Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> well, I mean, speaking of an anime that's definitely made the anime Hall of Fame, nah, that was kind of an okay transition. No, it was I, good. It was very good. I, well, it is good. But I want to talk about another one where you've actually played quite a few characters. And we're going to talk about it's the the movie starts them out as two but you eventually find out they're one character right. but uh but you also but i also want to open up the room for you to talk about a bunch of other characters you've been a part of in this series that series of course is pokemon but the first character i want to kind of dissect a little bit is uh dr yun who is later revealed as a uh, mirage master so again Look before we kind of dive deeper into this just kind of tell us an overview of how you got the part, any fun anecdotes involved, anything at all. Well, you know who's a big wig at, uh, in the uh, Pokemon world mm -hmm. is Lisa Ortiz, who was the voice of Deedlet in, uh, in Lotus War. So I'm pretty sure my audition came through her. <laughs> uh, it, it, but that, and that was my very first audition for, uh, for Pokemon. Wow. Um, you know, I knew a lot of the people who were working on it. I wasn't working on it. And I saw that, uh, you know, they started doing the movies, which was exciting because the movies went into the theater. Um, and I actually hooked up a, a couple of friends of mine to get, uh, to get good roles in, in the movies. A guy named Rich McNana, who I, I'd done a play with, and I brought him in and, and I helped him get up to speed. And then they came to me and they said, we want you to audition for this part. And they said, it's for one of the standalone movies. Yeah, there he is. Um, but they said it wasn't going to be in the theater. I think, wasn't it a direct to... DVD video? or yeah. something, yeah, direct to video, yeah, something like that. Um, anytime I do a mild, meek, intellectual character like Dr. Young, um, I usually make him somewhere between my all my children character, my soap opera character, Alfred Vanderpool, who was who was a preppy nerd, and uh, and Peter Cushing. 
my fallback for an intellectual character is usually Peter Cushing. I dig it. I mean, I can, I can see the uh, inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it does. Sometimes the inspiration can, you can overhear somebody talking on the subway on, on your way to a recording session. Sure. And I'll just pick it up and I'll do that guy's voice. Yeah, you know, I'll do my brother's voice. I'll do, I'll do my, my dad's voice. I, there's, a, there's a character. <laughs> I did an Italian animated thing. Uh, you can get it under the title Eggy or also the, uh, the title uh, Pet, Pals in, uh, Pet Pals in Windland. Um, and I, I voice King Cyclone, who's, who's the king of Windland, and he's incredibly into himself. Okay. So I, I have a former friend who's very well known out there in TV land, who is incredibly into himself. <laughs> and he played a incredibly into himself character on an extremely popular NBC sitcom in the 1990s. Uh, and everybody thought he was acting as he's playing this incredibly into himself character. But that's actually, <laughs> that's actually who he is. You're just being himself. <laughs> so I decided I was, gonna, I was gonna do it like, I was going to do it like him. Uh, <laughs> So that's, that's how I did it. It's, it's, inspiration can come from anywhere. The key is to stay open to it and recognize it and go, that's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that today. <laughs> no one's safe. No one's safe. <laughs> well, and then during, because yes, you voiced Dr. Yan in Mirage Master, but you voiced a lot of other characters in the Pokemon series. Mm -hmm. So are there any of them in particular that are kind of your favorites? Well, I was, you know, I, I benefited from the big cast change. Mm -hmm. Remember that whole thing when, I don't know, 10 or 11 seasons in, uh, oh, things, yeah. things changed and the whole cast had to change. Um, but actually, my, my first character on the series, it, wasn't be, it was before that because a guy who was doing it, he was a musical theater guy. And he booked something big and he couldn't do it anymore, so he left. And it was a character called Harley. Mm -hmm. And I said, great, I I'd, I'd love the work. I love doing the voices. Yeah, I'd, 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 of course I'll come in. I don't even remember if I auditioned. They just thought that I could match him. And I went in and I looked at it and I went, I can't do this. <laughs> Harley, hands on his hips, pelvis thrust out. <laughs> Hi, Han, say, nice Pokemon. And I went, <laughs> guys, that's not right. You, you can't do that. that. I mean, that's, that's an offensive uh, cliche in this day and age. You, you can't do that. And they went, that's how the Japanese drew it. That's how the Japanese wrote it. And that's how the other guy played it. So I played Harley that way. And I thought, well, I'm not going to work again here. <laughs> but nobody said anything. So they brought in Conway's probably my biggest character. And Conway's probably the closest to Alfred Vanderpool, except he's a little more nasal. And he talks out of the side of his mouth. <laughs> you know, he always is appearing out of nowhere. Uh, and people get startled by him, and that's a fun character to play. And then I, uh, I voiced Nando, who's a troubadour with a, with a very splendiferous hat with a plume and a little mandolin. And the, he would just strike a note, and he would sing a little rhyming couplet. And I decided I would do it. I nicknamed the character uh, Antonius Bandero, my, my flip on Antonio Banderas. And I decided he was like uh, Puss in Boots. It's nice to see you again, Don. I like how you work your Pokemon. <laughs> and I don't sing, but they just strike the note and I would make up uh, the melody. So Nando, Nando was incredibly fun to play. All right, Nando. Yeah. Well, well, and uh, I just want to point something out, guys, because we're approaching the halfway point before we continue. Uh, okay. For those of you watching live on Facebook, plenty of you have already messaged VisionCon directly or put your viewers' comments and questions directly in the live chat. You still have time to do so. Just wanted to say it because we're about the halfway point. So, but moving forward, you've mentioned this character multiple times and it's time that we finally get to him. And uh, for our audio listeners, this won't change at all. But for uh, those watching live on Facebook or later on YouTube, there's gonna be no slideshow for this character because uh, all the images I looked up were just images of you. That character is uh, Alfred Vanderpool from All My Children. So, Alfred Vanderpool, All My Children was my start. I was a kid in college and I got an opportunity to read for a role. Uh, and I, I almost got it. And uh, 
but I'd never had a professional audition before or a professional job. I was just doing a lot of college theater and, you know, that kind of thing. Sure. So they put me on one day as a background extra to see if I knew how to behave on camera and how to c conduct my business. Yeah. And it worked out well that I sort of, that became my thing. I transferred colleges so I could be closer to the city, so I could cut class and go in and do background work. Terribly exciting. I had a great group of friends that we sort of all kind of did background together. Uh, I auditioned for a character they're bringing on called Greg, who was part of the Greg and Jenny storyline. That was going to be the big storyline. And for three years, they were, or two years, they were in college. And they were the big romantic story. And I was constantly in the background of those scenes. And then they auditioned me for a character who was being brought back, who I'd been the stand-in for, called Tad, Tad Martin. And I almost got it. Uh, they hired a wonderful actor named Michael Lee Knight. But the producer came out of the final call backs and told the casting person they're going to hire Michael Knight. She said, but that Bill Timoney is the best actor I saw today. I want to create a role for him. Wow. <laughs> Greg was now at Pine Valley University, but he was, he was mad at his mom for trying to break him up with Jenny. So he was boarding in the dorm and they needed a, they needed a dorm roommate because uh, they were like halfway into the semester and Greg didn't have a dorm roommate. So they created Alfred Vanderpool who was very uptight, uh, very much a preppy nerd, uh, spoke very officiously, uh, was a throwback. He really belonged to the 1920s. And he was an intellectual and he did not know how to speak to girls. Uh, and he was comedy relief. So Greg and Jenny were often trying to help Alfred, you know, be cool, which was, which was a disaster. And it was really, really fun, you know, comedy of awkwardness. Um, and I did that. And I'm on the set with people like David Canary and Susan Lucci and Ruth Warwick, Mrs. Citizen Kane. I'm doing scenes with Ruth Warwick. I'm doing scenes with Eileen Hurley, who played Myrtle Fargate. You know, you know what, what I knew Eileen Hurley from? When Laurence Olivier made his film version of Hamlet that he won the Oscars for, yeah. where Peter Cushing plays Osric, the messenger. Hamlet's mother Gertrude is played by Eileen Hurley. Really? Then in the 60s, when John Gilgood directs Richard Burton as Hamlet on Broadway, who plays Hamlet's mother Gertrude opposite Richard Burton? Eileen Hurley. She, she played Gertrude to two Hamlets of the 20th century, the great ones, Olivier and Burton. <laughs> the last time I saw her was like 2004 or something. And uh, we were in a scene, we didn't have lines together, but I said, Miss Hurley, uh, and you, know, you better call her Miss Hurley. I said, uh, last night on Channel 13, they reran uh, Lord Olivier's Hamlet, and I watched it just because I wanted to see you again. Aww. And she went, and she went, and again, she was in her late 80s by then, maybe. And she said, I watched it too. Oh. I, I hadn't seen it since the premiere back in 1947, or whatever the date was. She said, and you know what I thought? I thought we really went at it hammer and tongs which is a, an old school phrase, two actors who just let it off fly. They're not being restrained at all. Yeah. Is you're, you're going at it hammer and tongs. And that was, so that was my education, to be with those people, to see how they conducted their business, how they were professional, and then to do scenes with them. So Alfred was, was my thing. And then he was kind of brought back because uh, a rap group called Boys to Men adopted Alfred as their image with the bow tie and the sweater vest and the preppy chinos with the penny loafers. And they used my character's name. One of, one of the guys in the band, Nate Morris, would say, I'm Alex Vanderpool, Alfred's cousin. <laughs> what an honor. Oh, it was cool. It was so cool. So I did that for the 80s. And then about 98, 99, they found me. And every now and then they bring me back to, to like a, the grown up Alfred was now like running the bank or running the chamber of commerce. Sure. And, come in, deliver some exposition, but it was, always, it was always a cool, cool gig to have and to be a part of. Well, and then Alfred is just one of your many, you know, on-camera roles, and you don't, you aren't just, because a lot of our previous guests on this show have been either actors on camera or voice actors, but not too many of them did both. But you, on the other hand, do. So I did want to ask, are there any unique advantages that help with, like, does acting, like on camera acting, help your voice acting and vice versa? Or are there any challenges involved in being both? Yeah, the, well, the, the challenge is you don't get as far in either one. 
Okay. I, I have a real scattershot. I love to direct. I love to write. I love to cast. Uh, I love to produce. I love to act. I love to act on stage and film, and TV and primetime and daytime and commercials. I, you know, I get, I'm just fascinated by this business. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a cinemaniac. And anytime there's a, you know, I've, I've staged sword fights for Shakespeare productions. I've done some stunt work when I was a younger guy in super low budget horror films. I've done some casting. I've done all kinds of stuff. That's either, what I just described, is either a testament to my versatility or it's uh, clearly uh, a symptom of undiagnosed ADD. <laughs> um, yeah, if you stayed with one thing, you'd get farther along. On the other hand, uh, I'm not a star. I, I haven't succeeded in branding my name with the public. So I don't get the big ticket items. So I, I look at myself like James Garner's character in The Great Escape, where he's Hadley the scrounger. He can always come up with something. So, I mean, I've had a lot of years where I was only hanging on, and I've had a few years where I've done pretty good, not really good, but I've always been able to come up with something in this business that I find satisfying, fascinating, and I'm able to generate enough coin to pay my rent. So maybe doing voice acting and acting wasn't really a smart idea, but it's just too fast. Oh, what? Sorry, I'm easily distracted. Um, oh, oh, look, a dime. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I'm not so sure. I know a lot of voice actors who would love to, uh, you know, I've, I've done two shows on Broadway now, and both of them were enormous hits. Um, I've done the soap. I've done primetime TV. I had a nice recurring role on the first season of the sci-fi channel movie, uh, TV show, 12 Monkeys, based on the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've, 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 got, I've done some really cool things. Um, so having admitted what I just said to you, it's still fine. I've, I've, I've just enjoyed <laughs> the heck out of my, my uh, career. Yeah, we're here for a good time, not a long time. Like that. I never heard that. You can, can take I use it? it. I'm writing it down, <laughs> writing it down. <laughs> Well, so with you having such a well-rounded aspect in the entertainment industry, being on-camera actor, voice actor, director, everything under the sun, these next two questions I think will be very unique to you because a lot of people who watch the show obviously are here to watch and meet the wonderful guests we have, one of which is sitting right before me. But a lot of other of them we've noticed are either wanting to get in the entertainment industry and want to know how they can or how, how, what they need to do, or they already are in the entertainment industry and just need to know what they need to do next. So I want you to keep that in mind for these next two questions. Okay. The first one of which involves rejection. So like I always say, rejection is just a part of life no matter how you look at it. However, if there was ever an industry that rejection would be most prevalent, it would definitely be your industry, which would be the entertainment industry. <laughs> so for our audio listeners, <laughs> um, Bill's doing some uh, impromptu acting. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm better now. <laughs> so for the folks watching at home that want to get in the entertainment industry or already are and just want to know what to do next, right. what would you advise them how to handle rejection when it inevitably happens? Does it get easier or... Is there anything that you advise them to do when it does happen? Don't go swimming if you don't like to get wet. Oh. Sheldon in Big Bang Theory claims he's mastered swimming because he passed a tutorial on swimming on the computer, but he never got into the water. Rejection is a major part of the entertainment industry, not just with actors but mostly with actors. And if you don't understand its role in your business, then don't do it. Because if this business were easy, everybody would become a successful actor. Now, Kurt Russell says something really interesting. He said, you know, a lot of what we are required to do as actors, it's not really hard. The hours are hard. And every now and then he has to climb under a moving train a uh, moving uh, truck like in a uh, uh, breakdown but it says life's not hard and if you find that it's hard for you to do maybe you should be doing something else what's hard about acting professionally is not the job what's hard is surviving from job to job and finding the job 
So for my money, the job is, is the dessert, is the green tea ice cream. Oh. <laughs> that the real work, you know, everybody you can name, truck drivers drive a truck, police, police, doctors, doc, and lawyers, loy. Uh, actors don't act. The vast majority of actors look for acting work. And every now and then they get to do the job. Wow. I mean, you could, if you sat down now, you could probably type out 75 to 100 names of working actors. And you go right to the TV shows and you go to, to the movies and you might be able to get 200 down. Well, the Screen Actors Guild membership is over 160,000. And we have a 97% unemployment rate on any given weekday. Only 3% of us are working. Oh my God. So here's the answer that I wish I had learned when I was entering the business. It is not personal. The reason you don't get a job almost always has nothing to do with your performance, your audition, your appearance. However, as actors, we can't help but make it about us. You don't get the job, you're crushed. Is this the universe telling me to move back to Missouri and go work with grandpa in the pharmacy? The reality is there are so many factors involved that have nothing to do with you on why someone gets a job or another. It took me far too long to learn that. I know that now, but in my 20s, I didn't, and that was a mistake. When the rejection does come, what you have to have in order to defend yourself against it is you are acting for one reason only, that you love to act. Because acting is a process. It's a challenge. It's a detective journey. It's an adventure. How am I going to inhabit this character? How am I going to deal with the, the dialogue? It's not just how am I going to say this? How am I going to gesture? It's more internal than that. And you have to have an internal criteria for you to satisfy. And when you have an audition, if you've satisfied your criteria, then you're a success. But if you base your success on whether you get the job and get the paycheck, you will not survive. The only way you succeed in this business, if you go in satisfying yourself and your artistic criteria. Now, success, financial success, it will only happen if you are convinced it will happen. It won't happen the way you expect it to happen. It won't happen in the time you need it to happen. But if you're sure it will happen, it will happen. And the opposite is completely true. It will not happen. You won't make it in the acting profession if you're looking for outside affirmation. How was I? Was, was that good? Was that good? Hmm. You're asking the director. You're asking your mother watching the, the TV. You're asking other people. You're letting other people determine your criteria on whether what you did was a success. And you won't make it then. Your criteria has to be internal only. Oh my God. Heavy, huh? Heavy, yeah. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> well, just like we've had, what, 55 guests before you say that, none of them, uh, I mean, with all that, got that deep. And that doesn't matter to me because mm -hmm. that's an external criteria. What, what matters to me is to pass this information, this insight along. Look, here's my deal on life itself, Zach. Life is an adventure where you're seeking your two eyes. You're using your two eyes to find the two eyes, insight and inspiration. Insight is how do I do that? How do I get that? How do I get her to stop calling me? How do I get that card? To, you're looking for insight to understand and inspiration to keep you going, which when you're an actor is very important. So you go look at Humphrey Bogart in The Big Sleep and you go, oh my God, 18 year old Dorothy Malone gives an amazing performance in that film in that one scene. That really, that really motivates me to be like her. You can find insight and inspiration everywhere if you're looking for it. Oh my God. Well, I mean, I know I learned something and I wasn't even going searching. <laughs> cool, man, cool.
<laughs> well, guys, before we go to uh, the viewers' comments and questions segment, it is your last chance if you have not already. Sorry, guys, I'm just kind of reeling right now. But if you guys haven't already messaged VisionCon directly or put in the live chat your viewers' comments and questions, it's your last chance to do so because, ladies and gentlemen, we're in the plug zone. Bill Timoney, now is your opportunity to plug, promote, advertise, whatever verb you want to use. Anything you want, the floor is yours, sir. Super fast because I know we want to get to questions. Number one, pick up A Life in Parts, which is the memoir of my friend Brian Cranston. Uh, Brian asked me to help him work on that book, and I was delighted to do so. There is ton, There are tons of insights and inspirations in that book. Uh, and you may not know this, but Brian Cranston started his career dubbing anime. No shit. Yeah, it's just kind of a secret, but but if you get the original, The Wings of Honey Maze, Brian is is in there. <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's that's a biggie. Pick up, uh, pick up. Uh, Brian, Brian Cranston, for those of you who are unaware, uh, main character of Breaking Bad. Yes, and many other things, but and many other things. Brian and I have been pals since 1983. Uh, in fact, we just we celebrate our birthdays like every two years together. I'm March 5th. He's March 7th to today. Uh, and every like every other year we get together when we were single and then when we we're both married with the girls uh, This year he's in LA and I'm here. So we, we didn't get together, but yeah, definitely pick up uh, his by his bio uh, life in parts uh, That's one number two. I coach I coach actors help them with their auditions. I help them with their career vision their career plans uh, I don't advertise um, But I'm very affordable for beginners and you can find me on Facebook just send me a message via Facebook. Let me know that you heard me here and we can book a Zoom session. I love, as you can tell, I love passing along what I have learned. Um, num number three, my three favorite animes are the G's. Genshigen, Gokudo, and Gravitation. Those three are my babies. I not only voice lead roles in them, I adapted the scripts, I directed the recording sessions, and I cast the talent. It was produced by my great good buddy Joe DeGiorgi up at Headline Sound. And uh, my baby is really Gokudo because we went crazy with that. And Genshigen, which is, which is about fanboys. It's about uh, an anime club with cosplay and manga and all that. And, and I voiced one of the two leads, uh, Madarame, which is probably my second best, other than Parn, Madarame is my, is my favorite long-running character performance. Uh, then wait, I, I took notes on this, what I wanted to tell you. Uh, I would like to, to know that there's two non-anime dubbing jobs I did. One is a Croatian film that was made last year called uh, My Grandpa is an Alien, and I'm the voice of the robot. Uh, you, and it's a very cool, it's, it's more of a family film, but it's very cool. Uh, and it's one of my favorite jobs. And my other favorite job is an animated film from Argentina called The Star Maker. Ooh. It's all done computer. It was done by graduate students at a university down there. And uh, the lead is the little boy. Who, find, who realizes that the stars are going out. They're being extinguished. So he gets on his little rocket sled and flies off his asteroid and goes to the place where they make the stars in order to save the stars. And along the way, he stops on a dead uh, rest stop and there's a rusted robot who's a hospitality robot, Unit 19. And he revives Unit 19, who has a bad habit of inappropriately projecting commercials for products that are long since dead. And I'm the voice of Unit 19, both the robot and the voice of all the commercials. And it's very much like Robin Williams in, uh, in Aladdin in that it's kind of schizophrenic. Sure. I love, love, love that job. And uh, I would love it if more people were aware of it and watched that, that animated film, The Star Maker. And that is the end of my plug zone. Well, and then guys, for those of you watching this later on YouTube, all the links are gonna be down in the description box below, guys. And then real quick, hey, Alexa, Remind me to watch Genshiken. When is it going to be Uh, tomorrow. It's not tomorrow, but I remind you. Ah, noon. It's not tomorrow, but I remind you. 12 p.m. It's not tomorrow. Tuesday. Did I remind you? Uh, afternoon. It's not tomorrow, afternoon. Okay, Alexa, thank you. <laughs> Genshiken and the fanboy club is 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 presented in a very very real fashion. It's oh, yeah. so so cool. It it sounds cool. I just basically, especially since I have a girlfriend who is very involved in uh, co cosplay. You know, I feel like that'll probably hit close to home. 
one of the guy, one of the guys gets a pretty girl as a girlfriend, and the other guys, it, it, it you know, like Penny in The Big Bang Theory, uh, Genshigen did that same sort of thing, but predated it. Oh, yeah, it's a very <laughs> cool. People did voices. It's yeah, Genshigen, yes. check it out. <laughs> yeah, all righty, guys. So with that said, we're going out of the plug zone and going right into our final segment: viewers, comments, and questions. So real quick, let me just scroll up through the comments and then the messages, and we'll get started. Okay. So a lot of people are agreeing with me uh, that uh, your answer to that one question about uh, rejection was monumental. Cool. Very happy to hear you guys say that. Thank you so much. So I feel like we, I'd be remiss if we didn't start out with the one and only John Turner. So uh, he had two questions. So his first one was, what was the toughest voice acting job you've ever done? Uh, probably the first, because it was, uh, it was an anime 18. And as, as much fun as I had doing all those voices, I was saying a lot of things that I wasn't so happy to be saying. <laughs> but like everything else in life, I got the opportunity because I was willing to do something nobody else wanted to do. Nobody wanted to do this thing. Mm -hmm. And I had to do a lot of monster voices where I got to say lines like, <sighs> a virgin, what a special treat. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was pretty tough. Well, and then he also asks, um, how do you manage to keep your voice in good shape when you have to do a lot of yelling slash shouting in scenes without damaging your vocal cords? Uh, clean living. I completely avoid clean living. <laughs> Hell yeah. And I, I'm always, John, I'm, uh, I'm not a trained singer, so I don't know, I don't vocalize formally. But when I'm on my way to a studio, or I know I have a session, I'm constantly singing. I'm, one of my favorite songs is the uh, theme song to the 1950s drive-in classic, The Blob. So I'll, I'll be singing The Blob in both the lower octave and the higher octave. Yeah, I just do whatever I do to just loosen up. Oh, yeah. So Ricardo tuned in and said, if you had the opportunity to reveal, or no, I'm sorry, to revoice any character in a movie or film that you haven't been in, who would you choose? Uh, I would revoice Brian Cranston. God, I hate his voice. No, uh, I'm sorry. Did I say that out loud? Um, yeah, a, a character that, well, you know, Gert Frobe and Goldfinger. They use somebody else for it. Why not? Yeah. Um, now I would, you know, I have done that. I've revoiced a lot of actors in films. I've worked for amazing directors like Sidney Lumet and uh, Ron Howard and M. Night Shyamalan. Oh, yeah, that's it. You ever see Sixth Sense? Bruce Willis gets shot in the belly by Don Wahlberg and falls back on, on his bed, groaning and gasping for air? Yeah. That's not Bruce Willis's voice in that scene. That's me. What? Yeah. Did you ever see uh, Hannibal, the, re the sequel to Silence of the Lambs? Yeah. Gary Oldman is all messed up in his wheelchair, and they're going to feed Hannibal to the wild boars, but instead Hannibal talks uh, uh, the assistant, Jelko Ivanek, into pitching Gary Oldman into the pit and the wild boars tear him apart and Gary Oldman is shrieking in horror as he's torn apart. Yeah. That shrieking is not Gary Oldman's voice. That's me. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, well done. I've, yeah, I've done some cool stuff. Yeah. All right. Tell me about it. All right. Um, I just did. I just spent an hour, Zach, telling you about it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, you're just adding to it. This is just the cherry on top. <laughs> well, Cheryl tuned in and uh, she didn't ask a question. She just said, you had great character on all my children. You, she started watching the soap because of you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. All right. And then we got time for two more questions, uh, both from my boy Aaron. He said, uh, in on first question being, in honor of Hunchback of Notre Dame's silver anniversary, uh, uh, same year as Pokemon, which of your favorite Pokemon characters, your voice, would you want to go to Paris with and why? So which of your characters that you voiced as po in Pokemon would you like to visit Paris with? I think I th my most recent voice, which I did in 2018 and 2019 on Pokemon, is the TV producer George Chirino, who wears like the salmon coral colored sweater tied loosely around and has his, his shades up, but everything is great. Yeah, that's fine. And I could certainly see him on sort of, you know, we're going to do a location shoot up here at the top of the... Power of, oh yeah, oh, oh Quasimodo, yeah, hun, yeah, baby, could, could you step over? Yeah, great. <laughs> what is it you want? Sanctuary? Oh, we could get that for you, sure. I'll just ask my assistant. That'd be great. Yeah, fine. Yeah, George Torino and Quasimodo in Hunchback of Notre Dame. Nailed it. <laughs> All right, and then uh, lastly, so his, his next thing wasn't actually a question, he just said, 
he loved it that you were a, a seafood lover as well. Good man, good man, Aaron. And then, okay, so our last question will be from my girl Charlotte, who said, besides acting and voice acting, what are some of your favorite hobbies? I live to take the dogs with my wife into the forest. There are so many state parks here and national forests, and I just, you know, cats, we, we, we rescue cats. I've had lots of cats in my life. Uh, uh, you know, I love to spend time with the cats and the dogs. I really like to commit crimes and hide the bodies. And, and I really like uh, seafood and sushi. Yeah. It's going to sneak wait, that one. Wait a minute. Wait, what, what was that middle one again? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this has been episode 56 of Vision Con Live. Before we wrap things up, Bill, any final thoughts or sage like wisdom to leave us on? I would say that if you want to do it, do it. And go where, uh, Peter O'Toole had, had a great line. If you want to be an actor and get on stage, go anywhere you have to go to get on stage. Uh, although he also said, but play leads. And I always envisioned myself as a character actor. And the problem with that, as Michael Caine explained when he won the Best Supporting Actor Oscar for, um, for Side of House Rules, and Tom Cruise was against him in the category, and Caine used his acceptance speech to, to yell at Tom Cruise. <laughs> Do you know what they pay character actors? You're one of the leads. Why are you in this category? You should be up there. So I would say do that, but do not put your, your fate, your future, your success in the hands of somebody else. If you're going to do it, do it. It won't come out the way you expect, but it will come out if you're moving forward. If, rather than somebody hiring you, do it yourself. Get a camera, shoot on an iPhone. Take an old piece of animation and revoice it yourself. Parody is exempt from US copyright laws. I hope you all saw a couple of years ago when The Dark Knight Rises was about to come out and a parody video was out there on the internet called uh, The Dark Knight and 60s Robin. <laughs> Have you seen it? I haven't. Google, Google, well, Dark it. Knight, 60s Robin. It was made by, uh, it's called the Paulie Lou Mixtape. Two actors, a guy named Paul and a guy named Louise, a woman named Louise. Uh, and they, they make parody videos. And I'm telling you, when it starts, you think you're watching Dark Knight and Bane. And who suddenly prances into frame but a Burt Ward lookalike from the 60s sh TV show. No way. Holy moly, Batman. I kept yelling at you to wait up for me. These slippers, I can't run. <laughs> Go wait in the car. What's the matter, mumble? It's, and because of that parody that, that nobody told them to do, they did it themselves. The guy who's playing Robin, is the guy who's Paul in Paulie Lou. He got, a, he got cast uh, in a regular role on the uh, Comedy Central show, Broad City. No way! You do not wait for someone to present you with an opportunity. You go do it yourself. And on that note, Zach. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been episode 56 of Fish and Con Live. Thank you guys so much for watching. I, of course, am your host, Zach Wilson, but much more importantly, this has been my very special guest, Bill Timoney. Make sure to check out all the links down in the description box below, guys. And as always, all, life, just remember, guys, that life's better when you have friends to share it with.